How are you doing? doing? And yeah, I wanted to let you know that I got the job you recommended for me. They loved what I had to say, and yeah, I'm super excited for it. Anyway, I have to run now, but wanted to say thank you, and yeah, call me back when you have a chance. Hey, Matthew. Sorry, Mr. Call. Uh, I've been having fun with the okay. just, just a lot of things. Uh, everything just keeps piling up. And I found that my mom just got COVID, so I don't know. I've just been exhausted lately anyway. But I'm happy to hear that stuff's going well, and I miss you, and I hope we get to talk soon. All right, bye. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord, according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they, su- they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men, who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of his house being laid. Though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. Ida ab o kanen aliku ala winogo owa kura kuiga aba ala unde nogonen ala wi urikme e kologonet ina yu mirikak nogo mende giripunuk one pue katrompet nogo wangui diable wi mende gata papurinen togolo wak tabak one punda le ka nogo wangui e kol nogo warik aliku ala lut er wongduk iterali noe enda gembugut nda ut yoragen Nagagarak dandak minogo warak minogo nogo warik kalikuala kawi wuriak nogo owa kabu aret urako yinuk ndawi wakolo gonet alikuala lutekwi wa yogwi eregwarak ndie kolo gonet kato belo mareto nititera limendegi mondok mondok kiniki kunik eni nakelo gomunguno yinuk ida kumi aboknen kalikuni nogo bala wa yinuk Que cogió Guarac. Beaucoup de prêtres, de lévites et de chefs de famille très âgés qui ont vu le premier temple pleurent à haute voix pendant que le constructeur pose sous les yeux les fondations du nouveau temple. Mais beaucoup crient de joie. Tout le monde pousse des grands cris. On les entend de très loin. Ainsi, les gens ne peuvent pas faire la différence entre les cris de joie des unes et les cris de tristesse des autres. To the powers, down to fundament, from the temple, from the year Het alle priesters in Amsterdam met trompetten. En de lievinte, 
die seens van Asaf, met zijn ballen opgesteld om die Heere te loof, volgens die instelling van David, die koning van Israël. En alle het aangehef met lof en dank aan die Heere, want Hij is goed, want sy goeder tiener heet oor Israël is verewig. En die hele volk het gejag met groot gejag toe hulle die Heere loof, omdat die fundament van die hees van die Heere was gele was. Y muchos de los sacerdotes, de los levitas y de los jefes de casas paternas, ancianos que habían visto la primera casa, viendo echar los cimientos de esta casa, lloraban en alta voz, mientras muchos otros daban grandes gritos de alegría. Y no podía distinguir el pueblo el clamor de los gritos de alegría de la voz del lloro, porque clamaba el pueblo con gran júbilo y se oía el ruido hasta de lejos. Когда строителям положили основание храму Господню, тогда поставили священников в облачении их с трубами и левитов, сыновей Сафовых с кимвалами, чтобы славить Господа по уставу Давида, царя Израилева. И начали они попременно петь «Хвалите и славьте Господа, ибо благ, ибо вовек милость Его к Израилю». И весь народ восклицал громогласно, славя Господа за то, что положено основание Дома Господня. Και πολλοί από του ιερεί και του λεβίτε και του αρχηγού των πατριών γέροντε πια, που είχαν δει τον προηγούμενο οίκο, καθώ τεμελιωνόταν μπροστά από τα μάτια του, έκλεγαν με μεγάλη φωνή. Πολλοί μάλιστα αλλάξαν με μεγάλη φωνή και με φροσύνη. Και ο λαό δεν ξεχώριζε τη φωνή του αλλαλαγμού τη εφροσύνη από τη φωνή του κλάματο του λαού, επειδή ο λαό αλλάλαζε με μεγάλο αλλαλαγμό και η βοή ακουγόταν μέχρι από μακριά. Κοντζούκτσακα, Ιωουάε, Τζοντζίτερ, Νόλτε, Τζεσάτζαντελεν, Ιεβόκλ, Ιππού, Ναπάλ, Τουλκ, Ασάπ, Τζάσον, Λεβί, Σάραντελεν, Τζεγμλ, Τουλκ, Σόσο, Ισραήλ, Βάν, Τάβισε, Κιουρεδέρο, Ιωουάλ, Τζάνσον, Χάτε, Σόρο, Τζάνσον, Καλ, Χάταπάμιο, Ιωουάκε, Καμσάχαιο, Καροδε, Τζούνεν, Τζίσον, Χάσιμουρο, Κι ίντζα, Χάσιμι, Ισραήλ, Εγε, 영원하시도다 하니 모든 백성이 여호와의 전지대가 노임을 보고 여호와를 찬송하며 큰 소리로 즐거이 부르며 그러나 솔로몬의 옛 성전을 기억하고 있던 나의 많은 제사장들과 레, 레위인들과 그 밖의 여러 지도자들은 새 성전의 기초가 놓인 것을 보고 대성통곡하였고 다른 사람들은 기뻐서 외쳤다. 이와 같이 사람들의 요란한 소리가 멀리, 멀리까지 들렸는데 우는 소리인지 기뻐서 외치는 소리인지 아무도 분간할 수가 없었다. 아멘 Good evening. A couple people are having a good evening. Good evening. Whoa. Hey, everybody. That was so cool. I love that. Language is so beautiful. Um, we're going to start standing again. Go figure. You know the drill. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Ethan. Um, I wanted to mention um, this song is brand new. Um, it came out on my late record um, that came out in November called Hymns and Soul. Um, if you haven't heard it yet, you can go 
look it up, Hymns and Soul, um, Mark Barlow. Um, and who knows this song, Face to Face? Okay, a couple of you, tight. I'm glad it's not a foreign to y'all. And for, the, for those of y'all who don't know it yet, we're going to do I Teach You the Chorus, and then we all sing together, yeah? I want to know you more than I've known you. I want to give you everything because you gave your all for me. I want to know you more than I've known you. I want to love you the way you love me. Sound good? You ready? Let's try it together. I want to know you more than I've known. You can clap if you want to. I want to give you everything because you gave your all for me. I want to know you more than I've known you. I want to love you the way you love me. Yeah. The clapping, I think the clapping is going to help. Let's, uh, Ethan, what do you say? Yeah. As the deer pants for water, so, Lord, my soul longs for you. Mm -hmm. Separation is over, yeah, yeah. Now that I'm seated with you, my heart and my Cry out for you, oh Lord. Face to face, there's so much of you to adore.
love you, Jesus. I bless your name face to face, face to face, and heart to heart. Break through all the walls I've tried to guard. Here is, here is my love, here is my praise. I love you, Jesus. I bless your name.
Spare a drop of oil You brought us so close You brought us so close Face to face And heart to heart Break through to say something real quick and then we're going to go into the next song but Jesus talked about a couple of things that he feels really loved by he felt loved when the woman poured out a year's salary worth of oil at his feet and she wiped his feet with her hair That might sound weird, but he felt loved by it. I don't really know much about what happened in that culture with like pouring oil on people's feet, but he felt loved by her spending it all on him. And I just wanna let you know that you have full permission to spend your whole life on Jesus. And he feels loved by your yes and by your obedience. Obedience is better than a sacrifice. Every time, it'll always trump it. We wanna love him with our yes. We wanna be the type of believers that will go anywhere that he takes us. And that when things get hard, we're not gonna run away from relationship with him. I don't know about you, but I do. Ne I never wanna run away from him. Even when I cannot see your spirit is leading me. Your voice quiets my fears. Your hand wipes every tear. So I'll go. I know your love will sustain me And I don't care if I look crazy, no So I'll go anywhere you take me Even, even when I
anywhere Jesus we really will go to the east to the west to the north to the south through the highs through the lows we never want to leave your side God and the only way that we can even desire such faithfulness out of our own hearts toward you is because you've been so faithful from age to age to age. And this whole time, we're just going to lean on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, I just want to say thank you so much to the band for leading us in worship like that. That was beautiful. Let's give it up for Isla Vista one more time. It just gets better and better every time. It just gets better time. and better and better. I hope two weeks from now I'm going to be walking around campus and I'm just going to be here and like, I'll go, I'll Ooh, go. Maybe. I think, it's not release. I think maybe. <laughs> It's yeah. possible. We you're won't right. tell anybody about the song. You're right, you're right, it's you're just right. for us. I'll send, you the, I'll send you a little link. All right, sounds good. Oh, <laughs> I'll send you guys the link. Does that sound good to the song? All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't really do that. I feel like there's copyright there or something. <laughs> she gonna anyway. burn it on the CD. <laughs> um, what's up, guys? How y'all doing? How was your break? How you feeling? Y'all tired? I can tell y'all tired. You ain't clapping like you were the first time. This side is doing really well. Yeah, it's all right. This side is asleep. Oh. Oh, never mind. This side isn't asleep. They're better, awake. Better. Uh, my bad. <laughs> also introducing our, our family, also part of Ivy Vista Worship, John Hahn and Hannah Weidman in the front seats right here. We love them. Welcome That's family, to Viola, baby. Family. family. Welcome. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to get us started right now. Um, before we get into introducing our next speaker, we just wanted to remind you guys that we have a 24-hour prayer room. I know I keep talking about it, but it's because it's lit. It's going to be so good, guys. If you get in there, get alone with the Lord. Spend some time to really hear what he has for you this weekend. I really encourage you to do that. And also, uh, don't forget, after the speaker's done, we always have the boxes outside for you guys to respond and write a thank you note, too. So please do it. If you didn't do it last time, do it this time. Yeah. Come on now. Show the love. Easy Show the love. gratitude. Easy love, baby. <laughs> and uh, you know what? Uh, I yeah. forgot that I was introducing him. So uh, I'm going to introduce him now. Uh, you love him. You know him. This is my boy. I was slain the first time he talked. Ben Stewart. Uh, we going to introduce him uh, not again because we already did, right? He's the same dude. You can read it again. He's the same as you said. We're going to read it again, though. Remind him how cool We're going to remind him. Yeah. Ben Stewart you know, is the pastor of Passion City Church, Washington, <laughs> D.C. Before joining Passion City, Ben was an executive director of Breakaway Ministries, serving thousands of college students at Texas A&M. Ben earned his master's degree in historical theology from Dallas Theological Seminar, Seminary. <laughs> um, he and his wife, Donna, aim to equip and inspire people to know and walk with God for not just a minute, but a lifetime. So let's welcome him to the stage, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All right. All right. Hey, everybody. Man, it is great to be back. And it has been awesome to be here with you. So thank you for hosting Brendan and I so well. And it's so encouraging even to worship among you. And, and um, I hope I didn't weird anybody out. I, I like to look around and watch people worshiping, which sounds creepy, but... It just helps me pray, right? Um, it helps me pray for you. Um, you know, it's, 
the gospels say that Jesus saw the crowds and saw they were harassed and helpless uh, like sheep without a shepherd. Harassed meaning things are constantly pushing them and helpless meaning they lack the resources to combat some of the pressures in the society around them. And rather than shaming them, it said he had compassion on them and so he taught them many things. And so I found for me when I preach a lot of times, I wanna do what Jesus did. I wanna look around and think about the challenges facing you and I wanna have co-passion with you, I wanna care. And from that place, teach you what I believe will help you, and that is the enduring word of God. So if you got a copy of your scriptures, we're in Genesis chapter one, so just go to page one, and let me read a couple verses, and we'll pray, and then jump in. Genesis one, starting in verse one, says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. I'm going to skip to verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Uh, Genesis 2, verse 5. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground, a mist used to go up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living creature. And finally, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Let me pray for us. Well, Father, thank you for a few minutes around your word and for everybody here. And I just, my heart was uh, burdened as we were singing that that I'll go wherever you want me to go. And Lord, I feel like there's people here praying that that don't even know what that sentence might cost them. But I pray, Father, that they would, as much as we can assess it now, see the beauty of Jesus and and still mean it and say it's it's true, because it is true. And then God, I know there's some of us in here that whether we sang those words or not, we, we don't really mean it. Um, we know we're supposed to, but we're not sure we can trust you. So wherever we are in our spiritual journey with you tonight, God, I just pray you would help us move forward. Solidify and strengthen that commitment to you or help Lord unravel some of the distrust that's, that's keeping us stuck where we are. Lord, the spiritual life is event and process. There's, there's daily processes, but I believe you can use events at times to shape people's lives powerfully in a moment. I've been praying that over this whole conference and I just feel it for tonight. I'm asking you, God, to do something powerful and significant and life-changing in the hearts of some women and some men in these rooms. And God, I can't create that. We're asking you to do it. And I just want to invite you guys, if you're up for it, just take a moment again. And if you're willing, ask him and say, Lord, please teach me tonight. And then if you would, please pray for me that the Lord would use me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. Use this time. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, several years ago, I visited the Navy SEAL base on Coronado Island in San Diego. And I was invited by one of the SEALs there to navigate 
their obstacle course. And so for several grueling minutes, I was climbing up walls, negotiating nets, swinging ropes, just sweating and just grunting through this grueling process that I completed. And to my shock, they told me I completed it in just under 12 minutes, which was the minimum time to be considered to be a Navy SEAL. I was very impressed by that. Thank you. Yeah. And then the SEAL who had invited me to run it said, now let me try. And he negotiated the same obstacle course in less than six minutes, walking leisurely between each obstacle. And I remember as I saw him do that, I was like, well, he's had more practice. And then I thought, and he's a Navy SEAL. And when I had to take nine Advil a day for the next two weeks to just function, I realized, you know, I don't think God built me to be a Navy SEAL. I've been finely tuned to read books and explain them like God. But I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time in that community. And every time I do, I always walk away contemplating my manliness and how much of it I have. And they never put that on me. They're never like writing me prescriptions for my manliness quotient. I just inevitably leave there. And, and the way it manifests for me is I start questioning like, why haven't I learned how to fire an M4 yet? When am I gonna get proficient at that? Or I go, what would be my first move in a knife fight? I don't even know. Like right now it'd be, I, and I don't think that's right. Or what if there's an emergency? I can't fly a helicopter. I'm gonna have to find a real man to do it. And I do stuff like that for a while until I realize, you know what, Ben? There's only like a couple thousand of these guys on the globe. Like if they're the standard of manliness, there's not a lot of men in the world. And so inevitably that makes me ask the question, well, then what does a man do? What's a man for? Like, what are the things I could do that I could say, that's what a man does? What are the things I could, could accomplish that I'd say, that's what I was made to do? And ladies, I'm not leaving you out. Let's back the lens all the way up and say, what is a woman for? What is a man for? What are we meant to do that we can say, I did it. I accomplished the purpose for which I've been made. I know what a phone does. I know what a hammer does. But what do I do? I remember when I entered college, a pastor said that, like one of the first weeks I was in college, he's like, the most important questions you're gonna get asked in these days are who are you and why are you here? What are you meant to do? And a lot of people don't ask it that way to you. They ask you, so what are you gonna do when you graduate? What are you gonna do with your life? Some of you are plagued by that question because you say, I don't know. <laughs> and it can be kind of funny, but then there's this genuine existential angst underneath it of like, what am I doing? What is my life for? Viktor Frankl, who survived the concentration camp, Auschwitz, wrote in The Meaning of Life that he wrote, life is never made unbearable by circumstances. And think about the circumstances that man was in. He said, the difficulty does not make life unbearable. He says, what makes life unbearable is the lack of meaning and purpose. And I think for many young men and women I meet, the terror of meaninglessness haunts your generation. And the reality is that a lot of the answers you've been given are insufficient. Well, just do what you love. Just do what makes you happy. I'm sorry, any criteria that can be successfully met by a serial killer, insufficient. <laughs> you know I love my work, and frankly, I'm good at it. Um, this is still bad. There's more that should be said. And so here's the reality. What I want to do is to ask that question. Say, what are we here for? That you could look at your life and say, I'm doing it. I'm accomplishing the purposes for which God put me on this earth. And I say it that way because if you want to understand a creation, you look to its creator's intent. Why did he make it? And that leads us back to Genesis. What are we here for? And it's fascinating. If you think about the original audience, they had been enslaved for years. They had been taught that you are here to work until you die at the pleasure of your masters and their gods. Right? And when God set them free and led them out into the wilderness, what happened? Moses led them out into the wilderness. He said, I have to reboot everything for you. I have to reboot what air is, what grass is, what you are. And so they would sit around the fire at night and he would say, let me introduce you to your God. Let me show you what he's like. And that's why you get Genesis 1. It's not really about creation. It's how creation shows you the creator. Let me show you what he's like. And then we find out that astounding reality, we are made in his image. So I wanna look at two attributes of God that are true in this passage, two things that he's about that we are meant to image in our lives. 
And then we'll look at some practical implications. So to start looking at God, it said in verse 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Did you notice in Genesis 1, 2, Genesis begins with a negative situation. There was formlessness and void and darkness over the deep. Those are four negative terms. Now, a lot of commentaries, whole books have been written about what happened there between verse one and verse two. What is this negative situation at the very beginning? How did it come to be? Was this the angelic realm fallen and God recreating? Is Genesis one, two, the recreate? We're not gonna get into any of that. Fascinating, leaving it. Yet all commentators understand there's a negative situation here. And primarily those first two words, there's formlessness and void, right? Uh, in Hebrew, they're the words tohu and bohu. You know, it sound like a clown duo, but they're actually a real problem. Tohu is, is a lack of form, a lack of structure. Th- think no vase. And bohu is a lack of fullness. Think no flowers in the vase. There's no structure and there's no life. But then the verse ends with, but the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. In the midst of this chaotic watery matrix, the spirit of God exerts himself upon the chaos. And you watch your creative God begin to create. And he commands, let there be light. And there was light. And he saw it was good. And he separated the day and the night. And there was evening and morning one day. What is evening and morning? It is the rotation of the earth. And so by day one, you get molecular energy. There's this watery matrix. You get electromagnetic energy. Let there be light. And you get gravitational energy. God begins to spin this water. And as God begins to move, what happens? As he spins this watery matrix, it begins to separate. And you see the waters above separate from the waters below. He creates air. And then in day three, as the water continues to spin, it recedes and you see the land appear. And so by the end of days one, two, and three, God has created the sea, the air, and the land. Everything you need to be a Navy SEAL. (laughs) And if you look at it, he's creating the teleological support structures for life. He just solved Tohu. And then as he moves into days four, five, and six in beautiful poetry, all these structures he built, he now fills with life. And it's beautiful. He fills the heavens with the heavenly bodies. We don't have time to get into that. I don't know if you could have a favorite day of creation. Day four might be mine. Because what they were taught in slavery is that creation is the product of violence and rape. And so when you look up at the skies, you see violence and you see misogyny and the abuse of women. That's what you see. And you are a product to be used. And God says, no, you look up at the heavens and you see these were made to rule over the darkness. They were made to give you signs so you know where to go. Seasons so you know when to harvest, when to plant, when to, uh, when, when to, to, go, to rise up and when to go to bed. Uh, it, it gives you day and night. It gives you a rhythm. These things aren't signals of abuse. These are the loving gifts of a father. And then you see in days five and six, what does he do? He fills the air with birds. He fills the sea with teams of sea creatures. And then he fills the land with animals and humanity. He solves bohu. Then he gives us the air and puts the birds in it. The sea puts the fish in it, land and puts the animals. And then he slows down and says, let us make man in our image and our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, the livestock and over all every creeping things. And he made us male and female in his image. We suddenly realize what all this was for. He built this structure and then he filled it with life. And why did he do it? He did it for us. So I had a friend um, not long after college get engaged. And like a lot of young Christians, he and his fiance wanted to be sexually pure before marriage. And so like a lot of young men, that meant he had a lot of pent up energy. So he decided to build all the furniture in their house from scratch. He did it, it's unbelievable. I'm, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I can't put together a desk from Ikea, I can't. I'm just like, I'm lost, I hate this, I hate it. This guy was in the forest going like, that looks like an end table, all right? And just chopping it down and making furniture. And I remember showing up in his house the night before he was gonna get married. And I'm looking around, and he's showing me all these furniture pieces. I'm like, dude, this is absolutely amazing. And as I took it all in, I was like, from the wisdom in your mind and the strength of your arm, Because of the love in your heart, you built this home and it's a display of your glory, but it's more than that. It is a display of your glory made 
so that you can enjoy and build memories with this person that you love and are covenanting with for a lifetime. And you look here at Genesis, and that what is what God has done. He solves tohu, let me build structure, and then he solves bohu, let me fill it with life. It's not a stifling structure, it's a structure conducive to life. It's a structure that allows living things to flourish, and so he blesses us and puts man and woman in there, and our first full day is a day to be still and enjoy And then in Genesis 2, we get the creation story told again, but from a more humanity-centric perspective. And did you notice in Genesis 2, it starts with a negative situation again. There was no shrub, no plant, no rain, no man, four no's. No, 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 no. No plants, no water, no us. And so God solves the water situation. And then what does he do? He pulls up some dust. And the same word is spirit. God breathes into that dust. And that same animating spirit that created the world breathes into our nostrils and creates the man. And then God takes that man and he puts him in the garden. And did you see what he said to do? He said, I want you to cultivate it and to keep it. What does the word cultivate mean? I'm not a gardener. I had to ask one. What do you do when you cultivate? You you go to raw material. We didn't create from nothing like God, but you get the raw materials under your control and you organize them. You take little sticks and you tie them to little plants so they'll grow straight, not to torture them, not so these little vines are like, why I got like, you, you organize them so they can be maximally fruitful. That's what a gardener does. Let me arrange these raw materials so these trees can reach their full potential. These vegetables can achieve their full potential. Let me organize a structure that allows life to flourish. We look like God. We build structure for the sake of flourishing. Do you see that? Forms for the sake of fullness. And I remember looking at that as a young man, struggling legitimately with why am I here and realizing that is my God-ordained purpose in life. For God's glory and for the good of every living thing under your control, you are meant to build structure for the sake of flourishing. Do you see that? You are meant to go into chaos and to cultivate life. That's what Moses did. As they were brought out of slavery, they were a chaotic band wandering through the wilderness. By the time they exited that wilderness, they were organized in tribes, each with responsibilities, marching in rank and file with the Ark of the Covenant in front of them, heading into God's promises. That's what kings do. Kings build kingdoms. What's a kingdom? It's a structure. It's a system of rule so that humanity can flourish. You don't vacation in a lawless land because structureless places are dangerous. We need structure, but not stifling one structure that produced life. That's what Ezra and Nehemiah did. There's no wall here. And so every danger can completely harass these people. We need to build these structures so that life can flourish. That's what we've been learning about with Nehemiah and Ezra. And that's what we are meant to do. Architects build buildings, structures, so we can walk into them and live and have classes and interact with each other, right? Financial managers position money. Why? So that money can be maximally fruitful, so we can reach its full attainment. Teachers organize teaching environments that they can get that knowledge and put it together in an interesting way so that it lands in you, so you understand the world that you've lived in. Husbands are meant to take their time, energy, money, and resources and organize them so their wife can be fully who they're meant to be under God. Wives are meant to do the same with all the materials underneath their influence. They're meant to create an environment where their husband can flourish under God. Parents are meant to do that. We take our time, energy, money, resources, and we organize a home so our children can reach their potential. This is what you're meant to do in work. This is what you're meant to do in home. This is what you're meant to do in life. We enter into the chaos and we cultivate for the sake of flourishing for God's glory. That's what you and I do. And that's what Christ did for us. That when all this was undone, and the enemy brought chaos, what happened? Christ stepped into that chaos and he built a kingdom. He said, I will push back the darkness and I will create a kingdom. What's a kingdom? It's a structure, a system of rule. To stifle you, to hold you back? No, to set you free to be fully who you're meant to be under God. This is what God did for us. This is what we're meant to do in the world. Wherever you end up going, musicians organizing notes to stir the human heart, teachers like me organizing words so these concepts are understandable to you. All of us are cultivators. That's what you're meant to do with every day of your life, with every bit of influence God's given you for his glory and for the good of us, right? All of us have that job. Now, there's a lot of directions we could go from here. 
But where I want to go with our remaining time is say, let's start by cultivating you. How do we make sure you are in a total mess of a human being as you step out in the world and represent Christ? Because we're meant to cultivate ourselves. And what do you do when you cultivate a garden? You, you, you plant some things and you uproot some things. Say, hey, I need to cultivate certain ways of thinking and ways of living, and I need to uproot ways of thinking and living that don't belong here anymore, right? This is what God's done for you and for me. This is how you know God has moved into your life. He does this in us. I remember the first house I ever bought, uh, my wife and I, when we moved to College Station, uh, you, you could tell the previous owner didn't care about it just by the condition of the yard. There was no grass at all. But there were weeds, millions of weeds, robust, angry weeds, taller than me. How did the neighbors know a new resident had moved in? Because I took a weed eater and I went to work on those weeds. I was like a little man in a big salad, just mowing it down. And we tilled up that soil and we planted seeds and we nurtured them. So over time, there was, pro- there was less weeds and more grass over time. Now, six months later, was there a lot of grass? No. And were there still weeds? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so much so that if someone was just driving by in a moment, they would say, clearly no one lives there. But they'd have been wrong. Because <laughs> they hadn't seen the progress over time. And when Jesus Christ takes up resident in a human life, He says, I love you right where you are and love you way too much to let you stay there. How do you know the spirit of God has invaded a human life? The same way you see it in Genesis. He exerts himself on your chaos and he begins to cultivate. Hey, it's time to uproot some things. Some of these relationships, some of your ways of interacting with other people, it's time for this to go. I'm pulling this out. And there's some other ways of thinking. There's some other ways of living I want to cultivate and bring to life. He goes to work on us. That's what our king does. And I want to help you be the most efficient people at the most ultimate of things because I want the eternal to touch down in your mundane. You understand it? And some of us right away, you already feel that. It's time to uproot some screens from your life. It's time to plant some scripture instead. It's time to uproot some passivity in your life. And it's time to initiate in things that matter. It's time to uproot the inordinate amount of isolation. It's time to plant yourself in community and learn what love looks like with skin on it. All of us are gonna see this in our own life. This is what Nehemiah did. Do you remember? He had a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. I battle and I build. That's what we're meant to do. So let's aim this at us. Let me give you four pillars of a structured life for the glory of God. Can I do that? Are you all with me on this? I still got you. There's big lights in my face. I can't tell if you're awake or asleep. You hear? There it is. <laughs> Number one is you need a productive schedule. A productive schedule. Surprise, you didn't think I was going to say that. <laughs> you need a plan of attack. Because if you don't have it, you'll be subject to the dual attack of unproductivity and stress. Tell me if you haven't found that. Ask anyone how they're doing. Man, I'm so busy. But then you get to the end of the day and you go, what'd you do today? What did I do today? And the reality is many of us feel that. I feel like I have so much to do, but I feel like I didn't do anything. And let me tell you something. It's kind of funny in your 20s. It's terrifying in your 30s and 40s. And that sense of meaninglessness stalks you and opens a wide door to addiction. It really does. And you need to get a handle on it now. And I know for me, when I first exited college, I exited college, I imagine like Biola, where they had sort of trained me upon exiting this institution, you will step forth and take over the world. And I just assumed I would do that and I would launch out, but I would show up in my office as a youth pastor that had never had a youth pastor. And I was like, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. And I would sit at my desk, what am I supposed to do right now? And then someone would say, I need help with a copier. And you're like, well, Christians help. And so I'd go do this, even though I have no idea. And I would spend an hour fiddling with a copier. Hey, you want to go to lunch? Sure. And I'd go to a two-hour lunch that had no strategic purpose. And then I would come back after eating some heavy barbecue or something and be like, I feel so overwhelmed and I'm so tired. And then every Saturday night, I was writing a sermon for Sunday and realizing, why am I, why am I in this place where I never understand? I'm always stressed when I'm sermon writing because of these emails, but I'm stressed with these emails because I got to write a sermon and I'm stressed while I'm talking to you because I got to worry about calling that person back. And I'm stressed calling that person back because I'm supposed to minister to you. And I feel like I'm failing in every category. And persistent failure opens the door for you to fail morally. 
And many of you, if we're honest, you're like an octopus with roller skates. A lot of movement, but it's not forward. And yet God looked at the chaos and he brought structure for the sake of flourishing. Let me give order for the sake of life. Ephesians 5.16 says, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. There's too much darkness in the world for us to be content with an unproductive life. And Jesus commanded us, pragmatiza, make a profit, take the talents I gave you and put them in a place where they will maximally flourish. Grow them. Take your five talents and make them 10. Do something with your life. And so for me, what I started to do when I was in college, and this really gripped me, I would take a blank piece of paper and I wrote out my roles under God on top of that piece of paper. What has God made me to do that I understand? I'm a student. I'm a steward of resources, though they be little. I'm a child of God made to know him, right? I'm a child of my parents. I'm a leader in this organization. And then I would take all the responsibilities under those roles and I would dump them out on a piece of paper. I wouldn't let them roll around in my head and stress me out. I would just vomit them on this page, but in these separate categories that I was given by God. And then I would take my schedule in 30 minute increments and I would look at it and I would schedule in my class schedule and then I would look at the rest and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do with the rest of this time? And I want to make sure the roles you gave me and the responsibilities they have fit into the time that you've given me because I want to be efficient at the ultimate things. And I want to structure my life by priority, not proximity. Do you know what I mean by that? I hear people say that all the time, that Jesus had a ministry of interruptions. You know, Jesus had a ministry of interruptions. No, no. Jesus wouldn't let himself be interrupted all the time. Jesus, I want to follow you. Let me bury my dad. Let the dead bury their own dead. Jesus, I want to walk with you. Fox have holes, I don't. Bah. And he would leave. Everyone's looking for you. I'm leaving. And all the time he'd walk away from people. Son of David, have mercy on me. Stop. Yeah, I'll do that one. Because that completely aligns with my strategic purpose. I am the son of David. And this man has faith in me. And these people need to understand what he's doing. And you see, Jesus scheduled his life by priorities, not by proximity. And so for me, I want to look at what are the roles I've been given under God and let them shake down into the life that he's given me. And I'm telling you, when you begin to do that, something happens. I used to do this with my college age interns when I got out of college. I gave them the purposes of our ministry, that we exist for evangelism and community and discipleship and service and worship. And I would have them put goals underneath each. Hey, under evangelism, write the names of every kid you know that you don't know if they know Christ. What's the next conversation you're going to have with them? Community, write the kid that you go, hey, that kid doesn't come on Sundays. I'm going to invite him. That kid doesn't come to small group. I'm going to invite him. See how you can move them deeper into the community. Service, what are some organ plays you're going to challenge them to serve? And they would put these names and their next strategic steps underneath them. And it was the craziest thing. And when I first introduced to them, we're going to schedule every Monday. They got about as excited as you look right now. They were like, I don't want to schedule every Monday. But by the end of the summer, they looked forward to it because I saw in their face what I want to see in yours. And that is a sense of agency. They said, I'm doing the work of an evangelist. I'm using my time to make a difference in the world. They were watching the eternal touch the mundane. And that is such an empowering feeling. I want you to know what that's like. To say, I have a schedule that's submitted to the Lord. And so I would encourage you, schedule out your class schedule. Then notice all the white space and say, what belongs to the Lord? And how do I schedule in a way that honors him? And I think the second thing you need is a positive sanctuary. A positive sanctuary. Where am I going to steal away with him? God built structure for the sake of flourishing. And then notice when he did it and humanity came on the scene, their first full day was a Sabbath. Before you work, rest. The rest comes before the war. He said, you are made to enjoy me. Colossians says all things are made by him and for him. So as I'm looking at my schedule, when I was in college, I would take this blank piece of paper, fill in my class schedule. This is where I know I have to be. And then I would look at these blank places and say, where am I going to steal away with God? Where am I going to go get to, get to know him? My freshman year, I had an existential crisis, like maybe some of you had. It just dawned on me my freshman year. I was like, wait a minute. I don't know if all this is true just because mom said it was. Mom's nice, but she can be wrong. And I struggled with my faith, and I realized I'm going to be honest with God. And I remember sitting in a missions conference like this, not singing, not out of protest. It's just because I wasn't sure I meant it. And one of the most powerful moments for me was at a missions conference where they said, everyone who wants to go, stand up. And the whole room stood up except me and one other girl. And we found each other later. And she's like, why didn't you stand up? And I said, because I don't know if I mean it. I said, I wasn't trying to do some theatrical thing. I just didn't want to say to God something I didn't mean. 
But I realized no one's convinced me he's not real. And so until I believe he's not real, I'm going to talk to him anyway. And I would go to this little park by my house and I would go to war with God. And I had it in my schedule. I would go and read his word and write out in my little devotional, you sound mean there, you sound petty, I don't understand it, amen, and would move on. (laughs) But I realized if he really did make me and he really did make all this, that I'm pressing into him and I went to war with him and I was honest with him. I let him come real and I came real. And in the midst of that matrix, as I gave myself that time in college, didn't bury it in the distractions of everything around me, I realized that I had some intellectual questions that were legitimate. I remember writing in my journal once a question that I thought was insurmountable, and I wrote at the end of it, no answer. And then I went to the mall, and I walked past this bookstore, and they had a book sitting on a pillar with a spotlight on it, like, ah, and I'm like, I must turn aside and see this strange thing. And I turned and saw it, and it was a study Bible that had questions in the margins in bold and the answers underneath. And the page it was open to was the passage I had read. The question at the top was the question I had just written. And underneath it was the answer. Remember, I was like, oh. Okay. The lady at the store was like, can I help help you? And I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. Right? And as I created that space to fight with God my freshman year, he began to service some deep pain in my heart over my parents' divorce, over some things that didn't go the way I thought they were in life. He began to show me I had some purposes in life. I wanted to succeed at certain things to get the approval of my father. It's not bad to want that love, but you're trying to take some things I put in your life and aim them in the wrong direction. Good gift, bad God. And God had to realign me and I beat on his chest and then fell in his arms and fell in love with God my freshman year. And so my sophomore and junior and senior year, every semester I would get my class schedule out and then I would look and say, where are the places I steal away with God? There'd be weird gaps in my schedule. I was like, that's the moment. God and I are gonna find a place every semester. It's gonna be that spot in the library. It's gonna be that football field. I'm gonna sneak on top of that building. I wasn't supposed to do that, but I did that with Jesus. And we would go places and I fell in love with him. And you need that. You need places to steal away with him. Paul said to the Corinthians, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. As you cultivate, cultivate devotion. Find your way. Do it consistently in the word of God. I began to write out books of the Bible. I still do that sometimes now, but I know for me now, I usually start by vomiting up my emotions to the Lord. I just write out all my anxious thoughts on a piece of paper, And then I like to write out the Bible in a different color, usually a darker one, more substantive color. And I let Ben's transient emotions bend around the eternal word of God. And as I do that consistently, not every day is monumental, but enough are that he's shaping me. And I found that even in these difficult days of leading a church in Washington, D.C. over these last few years, I have a stability under my feet. I remember saying that to someone at our church. We had just watched all these people fall out of ministry. And I said, I'm gonna make it. And she said, what makes you so special? And then she was like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way. And I was like, no, that's a good question. I said, you know what it is? It's not me. It's that when I wake up every morning, I was checking my phone first and letting all the anxiety in and then all day long was reacting. And I realized, no, this first moment doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him. And I have a consistent moment with the Lord. And as I do what Paul told the Philippians, that I cast my cares upon him, let my anxious thoughts be made known to God. And then I think about what is true and lovely and beautiful. I find that the peace of God is with me. And I want that for you. You will not be a successful agent of peace in the world if you're not cultivating it within yourself. And so you need a productive schedule. And in it, you need a positive sanctuary. And I would say a consistent one and a creative one. Steal away places where you enjoy being with him. I drove an entirely unnecessary amount of time today, Brennan and I did, to sit somewhere beautiful with the Lord. We could have sat in the lobby at the Holiday Inn and God could have met us there. But I thought, I got a chance to do something beautiful with the Lord. I'm gonna sit and look at the ocean as I read over Genesis and just, just be creative with him. I think the third thing you need is you need protective saints. You need protective saints. God said it's not good for man to be alone. And he created Eve to be a helper suitable for him, one that's a good fit. And and yes, that's about marriage and intimacy, but there's also about the broader concept of community. It's not good to be alone. 
Isolation is a form of torture. And the reality is we are an increasingly isolated generation and it has not good, done good things to us. So we need some people around us that will protect us and strengthen our hand in God. I remember for me, when I entered college, I joined a men's fraternal organization early in the process. And I remember as I got into it, I realized right away they were all cowboys. I'm like, how did I get in this situation? I had hair down to here, wore all linen. I was like, one of these things is not like the other. But I remember as I got into that organization, one of the guys came to me and was like, hey man, did you sign up for the service project on Saturday? I was like, yeah. He said, I didn't see you there. I was like, yeah, I know I had this thing come up, whatever. And he's like, oh, okay, so you said you'd be there and then you weren't there? Yeah, and he goes, okay, so your word means that little to you? I was like, excuse me? You don't know me. Even though all that you said is factually true, how, how dare you, sir? I remember riding with another one of these cowboys in the car and we were talking and I was telling him all these things that weren't going right, right in my life and how upset I was about him and how this wasn't working out and that. And he goes, you know what? You strike me as someone who loses perspective easily. I was like, you strike me as someone who's about to get struck. Like, how dare you? But he was right. And I realized I don't like the way this iron keeps hitting my iron. But they're not trying to destroy me. There's a way to hit iron against iron that crushes it. They're sharpening me. They're forging character into me. And I thank God for those men. And you need good people above you, mentors. Paul told the Philippians to observe those who walk according to the pattern of, that you've seen in us. I love it. It's the Greek word skopos. Scope out the people you see running with God and run with them. I needed people like that. I remember there was a guy, Chris, that I didn't want to be friends with him. I, I wanted to be awesomer with him than him. And it was important to me that I seemed that way. But I got to a point where I really wanted to know God and was hitting limits in my own personal devotional life. And I felt like God kept saying, you need to go join Chris's Bible study. I'm like, I'm not gonna go join Chris's Bible. He can join my Bible study. I'm not joining his. But I was like, God, I wanna know you. And I felt like it was in my heart. I remember leaving the library. And this is weird. I went to a big school. I walk out of the library. There's no one, not a human. It's like, I am legend. Like, where is everybody? And one solitary lone human walks around the corner and it's Chris. And he walks up to me and he was like, uh, hey man, I know this is weird, but uh, do you enjoy my Bible study? I was like, yeah, man, it is weird. And uh, fine, I'll see you there. We left. <laughs> and that guy was a little socially goofy, but deeply spiritual. And he introduced me to some books I would have never read before that changed my life. And I got to watch him go and serve Jesus around the globe in some powerful ways and he has inspired me my entire life. And I needed Chris and we need people above us. You need people below you that you can pour into. As I look back at my college years, there was a lot I wasted time on and yet there's some people that I invested the gospel into them and it was the best thing I did in my college career. And you need friends around you, friends that will stick with you, friends that will, that will run with you as you flee useful lust and pursue righteousness, love, joy, and peace, along with those who call out to the Lord out of a pure heart. You need a community like that. We need an us to make a difference here. I remember when I was in college, there was a community I was a part of, of believers, and there was a girl there that she didn't have some of the leadership gifts others of us did. And yet I remember she had some creativity in her, and she came to some of us once, and she was like, I wanna do a car wash. And we're like, why are we doing a car wash? Are we raising money? She said, no. I said, why would we do a car wash? And she said, I just thought because Christ came to serve, we could tell people Christ came to serve us. So as Christians, we wanted to serve you today. And we're like, that's weird. <laughs> but she was real all about it. And we were like, okay, but she didn't have the leadership clout. She was in our little social circle. She's like, I want to do a car wash for Jesus. And no one's listened to her. And so finally a few of us were like, hey, she wants to do a car wash. No, it's not clear why, but we're gonna do it. And, and she was an organized person. So she had all these organizational gifts. She got the hoses and she got buckets and she got the parking lot of this one grocery store. And she had this whole thing mapped out. She was like, okay, some of you are gonna grill hot dogs. 
Some of you are going to wash cards. Some of us are going to greet people. And, and as you walk them over to this other community, they can ask them what we can be praying for. So you're giving them food. You're praying for them while we clean your car. We're going to minister to people. I was on rim duty. And I remember I was cleaning these wheels and this guy came up to me and he was like, hey man, what organization are you doing this for? I said, no organization. He said, well, who do I write the check to? I said, we're not taking any money. He said, then why are you doing this? I was like, that is a great question. <laughs> and so I'm just doing this. I was like, man, you know, Christ came not to be served, but to serve, give his life to ransom for many. And we love Jesus. So we came to serve you today. That's why we did it. And I remember as I said that to him, he went, no, no. I was like, what? Yes. <laughs> what? I'm like, I'm not even supposed to be talking to this guy. And he starts crying. And he sits down on the curb. And he said, man, I was on my way to get drunk. This is nine o'clock in the morning. He said, I lost my job. No one's helping me. I was on my way to get drunk. I saw you guys. And I thought, maybe I'll get the car clean so my wife will be a little less mad. And then he just put his head in his hands. He said, I just can't believe you're doing this. And I got to put my arms around that man and pray for him. One of the most significant moments of my college career. And I wouldn't have been there without that girl. And some of you have the leadership gifts to rally us. Some of you have organizational gifts. Some of you are good encouragers. You write us notes that help strengthen our hand in God. You have different gifts the Spirit has shed abroad among us for the sake of us. And we need to put some of the screens down and step into the community God's given us for his glory and for our good. We cultivate this us for the glory of God and the good of the community. So you need a productive schedule. You need a positive sanctuary to steal away with God. You need protective saints who will strengthen your hand in God. And then finally, we need the power of the Spirit. Because ultimately, that's the only way any of this is going to have any meaning. And i got to wrap this thing up, but if you look in Genesis, it's the very Spirit of God blowing over the surface of the water that begins to move. You see this powerful, animating presence of God. And then God breathes into our nostrils the breath of life this intimate animating presence. Humanity is dirt and the wind of God. And so that's why Genesis 3 is so absolutely tragic. After we break faith with, with God, what does he say? Your dust and to dust you'll return. What's missing? The wind of God. That intimate animating presence. And so as you look at the demonstrable failure of the people of God in the Old Testament, you see they can't get it right. Do you remember they said under Moses as they got the law, all that is written, we will do. And do you remember what God said? Oh, that you had such a heart. You don't have the tools. And so the prophets begin to whisper of a day where the spirit of God will return again. And Ezekiel prophesies to the breath and says four winds blow. And he sees the bones begin to rattle and begin to form an army. And the spirit of God enters them and they march forth. And Jesus Christ, when he arrives on the scene, his first sermon, he says, the spirit of the Lord is with me. And as Jesus accomplished what he was meant to do, dying for your sin and mine, do you remember the first thing he did after he rose from the grave? John says he breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That intimate presence with God you lost, I brought back. I took the damage and the thorns and the thistles and the cross and the shame and the glory, gore of it all to that cross. And I buried your sin, your shame. And I brought back that very intimate, animating presence of God to fill you and to change you. So I've given you some structures to your life that if you do it, you'll be positioned to be someone who can work for the glory of God wherever he puts you. Some of you, it'll be in the medical community and you will use the medical gifts God's given you for his glory. I have a friend that moved to D.C. because of his medical gifts and the needs in D.C. when the pandemic was raging at its worst. And he said, I am daily the last person human beings see, and I'm the only one allowed in that room because of what I can do. And he said, and I am praying over them. And he said, and finally, I've just begun to tell them, do you know God? Do you have peace with God? Can I pray for you? He said, because the reality is they're about to meet him. And some of you, you have gifts God's given you, and you have no idea where those gifts will take you, but you know why. And you know, whatever gifts he's given you, it's so you can create an environment that in the chaos of this world, I will work with kids. I will work with old people. I will work with materials. I will work with art. I will work with ever to create an environment where humanity can flourish under God for his glory. That out of the chaos, I will do my part to build a kingdom. 
my wife and I were able to buy a house in Washington, D.C., which is a miracle. And as we did it, this house had been abandoned for 20 years. No one had lived in it for 20 years, uh, except for some animals and some porcelain dolls. Apparently, the previous homeowner, wonderful woman, had been a porcelain doll maker back when they were uh, in their heyday, very popular and less terrifying. But, <laughs> but over 20 years of neglect, there were shelves of doll heads with broken out eyes and hair. And yeah, it was a terrifying place. So when Donna and I bought this house, we threw away three dumpsters worth of porcelain doll material. I don't know if it stayed in the dumpsters, it's hard to say <laughs> if they made it out or not. But we cleared all that out and we put new floors in, we put new paint in, we put new walls in. And is there still work to be done? There's so much work left to be done on that house. But you would never know if you came to my house that it used to be a terrifying home of misfit dolls. And it's the same with you and me. You are a mess because of sin. You're broken and you're chaotic. And yet the Spirit of God has come into our chaos, right? The Son of God came to take on our chaos to build a kingdom. He has moved in as a new resident. And when he does that, he takes your chaos and puts in kingdom. He builds structure for the sake of your flourishing. And now for his glory, you're meant to do the same. That I step into a world that's broken, a world that's difficult, a world that's not easy, and I step into it as someone who's been changed by God, so I'll be an agent of change. But it starts here. And for some of us, as we talk through some of this, you realize, hey, there's some things in my life that don't belong there anymore. I'm playing games I don't need to play anymore. Life's too serious, it's too hard for me to not use my gifts for God's glory and the good of people who are hurting. And others of you say, hey, there's some things in my life I know are important, and I just put them off because whatever, I just figured there was time. But no, I'm about to take control of my own life, a sense of agency. I'm not seeking God because I'm supposed to at the school. I'm seeking God because he made me and I want to know him. That you begin to say, I'm casting some things out of this home, and I'm bringing some new things in because he made my chaos into a kingdom, and for his glory, I'm going to participate in that work. By his grace, might you be someone who looks more and more like your king for his glory and for the good of those he's called you to serve. So Father, thank you for a conference to call us to more, a conference to call us on mission, a conference to tell us to take our lives and to say, yes, Lord, where you call me, I'll go. And as I go, I will push back the darkness and bring light. I will push back the chaos and bring your kingdom, not by my own might, but by that intimate animating power of your spirit. But Lord, let that powerful work, before we go make a difference in the nations, let it start here. And some of us, God, the whole time I'm talking, you've been pressing on us, hey, there's some things in your life I've been whispering to you that need to be cast out, thrown away, put in the dumpster. And now I'm shouting it to you. And I just wonder if you could tell him, yes, God, I'll let go. There's some places I spend an inordinate amount of time that I don't need to hang out there anymore. There's some habits I've formed that are destructive that are sucking up my time that need to change. There's some relationships I'm investing in that yes, that person has value, but this relationship is codependent and unhealthy and I need to change the nature of this dynamic. And other of you say, God's been calling me to more. He's been calling me to serve and I haven't wanted to serve. He's been calling me to lead and I've been scared to lead. He's been calling me to go away with him to the quiet places and I've been scared of the chaos I might find within there. Whatever he's calling you to uproot, whatever he's calling you to plant, whatever he's calling you to cast out, whatever he's calling you to cultivate, I just wanna challenge you, Biola, right now as we come back to worship him, can you just tell him, yes, God, by the power of your spirit for your glory, may I fill my creator's intent. I say, yes. Cast out and cultivate. Change me, God. For your glory, for my good, and the good of all those by your grace I will influence. Lord, may California be different because this collection of young people takes your word seriously. May a state change. May a country change. May a world change. May it start here. Thank you, God. We love you.
And we pray that in the beautiful name of Jesus. that was so powerful. Thank you. That spoke directly to me, man. Um, because I'm so done with living from miracle to miracle. I'm so done with living paycheck to paycheck. I'm so done with living from encounter to encounter when there are systems that God has created for me to flourish in that I have not been participating in, leaving me feeling disconnected from that flourishing that comes from the structures that God has for us. Um, we've sung this one in a previous session, but we're gonna do it again because of how powerful it is to just think about the spirit of the Lord coming down into chaos and causing it to flourish. Um, as we worship, the prayer team is up front. Please come up and get prayer. Like they said in a previous session, like even if you're, even if you're doing well, in your strength, come up and get prayer. Even if you just want a free blessing, just whatever, <laughs> just come get one. Um, yeah, also, you don't have to stay in your seats. We can, you all can come up to the front and worship. You can worship in the aisles. Like this is a, this is a home. Cry. 
saved me, you saved me. I won't ever leave your love. Oh, no, no, no. You saved me, you saved me. I won't ever leave your love. I won't ever leave your love. Because you saved me from myself. I don't have to live for myself anymore. I'm tired of living for my own schedule. Spending all my money on me, spending all my time on me. What's the point if I'm a closed circuit and not in touch with the world you love and not in touch with the people that you love? Because you saved me from myself, because you saved me from myself. I don't live for myself anymore. No, I don't live for myself anymore. I live to see you lifted high. I live to worship you with my whole life. I don't live for myself anymore. Sing that out, declare it. Come on. I don't live for myself anymore. I don't live for myself anymore. I live to see you lifted high. I live to worship you with my whole life. I don't live for myself anymore. It's so fun. I don't live for myself. Better this way when I don't live for myself anymore. It's a celebration. I live to see you lifted high. I live to worship you with my whole life. I don't live for myself anymore. If the Son of God could lay down his life, who am I to hold on to my? The Son of God could lay down his life. Who am I? If the Son of God could lay down his life, who am I to hold on to mine? If the Son of God could lay down his life, who am I to hold on to mine? If the Son of God could lay down his life, who am I to hold on to mine? Son of God could lay down better this way because I get your priorities and I get your heart in me when I lay my life down I may not know the cost yet but I'm in it for the long haul I may not know the cost yet but I'm in it for the long haul. Sing that out. I may not know the cost yet, but I'm in it for the long haul. I may not know the cost yet, but I'm in it for the long haul. So I, so I don't live for myself anymore. 
just be our affirmation of every day of our lives? Have you guys seen the affirmations page on Instagram? You know, I don't know. You should go look it up. Affirmations. It's like all these really poorly created memes and they're supposed to be like affirming and encouraging and boosting your life. And some of them are like, I am not tired today. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Some of them are like, I am viral sensation. And it's like, I didn't really need to speak that over myself, but okay. Some of them are like, I did all my homework. <laughs> but what if this becomes our affirmation of every single day and our declaration, I don't live for myself anymore. I want to get a tattoo of that, man. Tattoos. Afterward? Tight. We're going to keep worshiping. Um, how amazing is it that we get to get freed up from a selfish life perspective? Oh my gosh. That's like springtime. That's like springtime every day. Because we're, we're the ones who get access to that because of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. That's a, that's a plus of salvation, y'all. That's something the world does not have. Yeah, there's like humanitarian efforts to give away things. And that like the, the only reward of that is feeling, feeling like you contributed something to the world, but when we get to truly not live for ourselves and give without expecting anything back because Jesus gave, that's crazy. And I don't care if it looks crazy. I'm so down. Oh, thank you, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Made for this. This is a song by our boy Alvin Muthoka from Circuit Riders. And um, this song is, has become an anthem for us in Isla Vista. As we worship before Jesus Burgers on Friday or at church on Sundays or whatever. It's just... Wow. Praise God. I'm, I'm just excited to sing this song. This is good. Your glory, 
Nothing can separate me from your love. I was made for this. I am redeemed and washed by your blood. This is my confidence. Nothing. Confidence is standing on who you are, the ever unchanging God. Your love annihilates the dark and penetrates the hardest heart. Your love defeats all fear of man and shows me who I really am. Your love sends pride down to its knees, confusing all my enemies. Your love is strong and uncontained. Your love is boldly unashamed. Your love annihilates the dark, penetrates the hardest heart. Your love defeats all fear of man and shows me who I really am. Your love. Oh, I am Your love is strong and uncontained. Your 
Hello, Biola. We love what is happening here, and we love to see the Spirit coming upon us like this. And if you want to stay here for extended worship, we want to invite you to do so for the next hour. That being said, rest is also holy. Sorry, what? The next hour or more. Who knows? Who knows? We're in church now. Who knows what God is going to do? That being said, if you need to go, we understand. No judgment, no condemnation. If you would like to stay, though, stay. Let's worship God together. Come on. After that, you got to stay. After that, come on now. Straight banging. And after our next hour of extended worship, we are doing base camp where we will be doing more worship. You'll have a chance to connect with the speakers. If there's someone that said something that connected with you, show up to base camp. It is from... It's from 10.15 10, 15. to 11. Yes, at the fireplace. Yes, fireplace, come on. All right, that being said, we're gone. Let's keep worshiping. Let's go. Sheesh. Your love. Your love annihilates the dark. Your love defeats all fear of man and shows me who I really am. Your love sends pride down to its knees, confusing all my enemies. Your love is strong and uncontained. Your love is boldly unashamed. Your love annihilates the dark and penetrates the hardest heart. Your love defeats all fear of man and shows me I really am your love since pride on to its knees, confusing all my enemies. Your love is strong and unconstrained. Your love is boldly unashamed. Oh, 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 oh,
Never, I've never known a love like this. What king would die to call me his? I've never known a love like this. What king would die to call me his? I've never, we're going to keep on singing. I've never known a love like this. What king would die to call me his? Everything else I count as lost. Cause you're all that I could ever want. I've never known. I've never
Sing that truth out. You died to be close to me. Yeah. You died to be close to me. You died to be close to me. You just want to be Some of us need to soak in that truth right now. There's nothing that you want from me. Just my heart. to be
choosing us. called us your daughters and your sons just because you love us. I'm going to tell a little story too. Um, along with what this song is telling us. And I got to share with um, someone last night shared about a struggle that they are going through and how I had the exact same struggle. I grew up in the church. I started leading worship when I was 12 years old because I had to. <laughs> there was unfortunately a big division and things that happened and I just so happened to be learning the guitar at the same time. No, looking back, God was orchestrating all of that. Um, and so I was leading worship and like, you know, you grow up, you become a teenager and life happens and you get sucked into some things, you choose some things. And in high school, I chose to be in a lot of sexual prom promiscuity and had a lot of broken relationships that I walked into. Um, and that led to so much shame. So much shame I carried with me all the time. Just looking for love, you know? That's why we do it. That's why we do whatever we do. And still had to go to church on Sunday. I still had to lead worship. And I remember God would still move. And I'd be just like, shame, more shame, right? Like, I don't deserve this. I can't, there's no way that this is me. And it wasn't me. And I got revelation about this years later. Thankfully, God freed me from all that. I chose, um, to walk with him, to truly be saved um, in college. And, but later I got revelation on that. And the reason God will still move and he'll still do things in spite of us is how greatly, how deeply he loves people. He loved everyone in the congregation that I was responsible for leading in worship so much so that he would still move in that space knowing you'll get there, Victoria. You'll get there. I paid for it. And there's something to learn in this. He just loves us. He just died. He died just to be close to us the barrier, the things that you think you need for love, I paid for all of it. And I'm here, arms wide open. I remember when I finally, finally decided to choose him. I, he was like, I've been here the whole time. There was never shame. There was never like, finally, it was just love. Like, yes, she's here. And I just want to encourage you that that's what he paid for. Just to sit with you, have time with you. His love is so great. Thank you, Jesus. you have for me no more 
for striving to promote myself I've got nothing left to achieve It's time that I have reconciled to the love that you have No more striving to promote myself I've got nothing left to achieve It's time <laughs> It's time that I am reconciled To the love that you have for me No more striving to promote myself I've got nothing left to achieve You gave it all to bring me home in your arms Now I belong There's nothing left for me to work for. It's time. It's time that I am reconciled to the love that you have. Striving to promote myself, I've got nothing left to achieve. It's time, it's time that I am reconciled to the love that you have for me. There's no more striving to promote myself. I've got nothing left to achieve. You gave it all to bring me home in your arms. Now I enslaved me 
You made me new beyond the powers of hell. You gave me truth that will approve me well. A whole heart that you gave me Instead of my brokenness that enslaved me You made me new beyond the powers of hell You gave me truth that will approve me well It's all hard it's a whole heart that you gave me Instead of my brokenness that enslaved me You made me new beyond the powers of hell You gave me truth that will approve me well Because you love alone Your love alone is powerful. Your love alone is powerful. In me, you gave it all. You gave it all to bring me White as snow, you're white as snow, you're white as snow. Song of Solomon says, you are beautiful and lovely, my beloved, and there is no spot or blemish in you. That's Jesus talking to us. Amazing is it?
When his son was a far way off, the father picked up his robes and he ran. Totally undignified, he didn't care about his dignity. He picked up his robes and he ran. He saw his son from a long way off, which means he was looking out. He was waiting for his prodigal to return. Thank you, Jesus, you're so patient with me. You always wait for me to return, return. Well, now is our moment. Now is our moment. Now is our moment. Can you sing that out now? Now is our moment. Now is our moment. Now is our moment. Now is our moment. And you have captured my heart in ways I didn't know that I could be captured. You've captured my heart in ways. Didn't know that I could be My questions go too large And I feel that I run far My memory fails me right I get enslaved to my own mind Forgetfulness of your grace Drags me around for miles until I see, until I see the corner of your smile. Oh, you were good to me before I knew your name. Oh, your grace freed me from my selfish pain. lost and I felt the need, the need for you. How could I ever leave? Cause you've captured my heart in ways I didn't know that I could be captured. So short from what I can't achieve. Start to agree with what I don't believe. My sensory fails the truth as I disremember who I am in you. You were good to me before I knew your name. From my selfish pain, my selfish pain. I was lost and I felt the need, the need for you. How could I ever leave? Oh, you captured my heart in ways I didn't know I could be captured. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Son down to save me, Father's endless mercy. Prepared a table for me. How can it even be? 
You sent your son down to save me and Lord, the name when I prayed for cure. For yours, Lord, the name will I praise. For yours, Lord, the name will I praise. For yours, Jesus, 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 you're the love of my soul. with me you're so patient with me and you come you come every time when I call those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved the name of the Lord is like a strong tower the righteous run to it and are saved that's why there is no other name that I'll praise, but yours, Lord, by the name that I praise, but yours, no other name, no other name that I praise, but So patient with me. You're so patient with me. Your love is me. Be where I need it. Most I don't need. Truth for the keeping, your word you mean. Cause my God, you never lie. Your love is meeting me where I need it. Most I don't need to hide. Truth for the keeping, your word you mean. It. Cause my God, you never lie. Even if I run. Away, even if I'm falling on my face, you will prepare a place for me, waiting on my full return to thee. You kiss away my brokenness, you could cure me from this hopeless heart. I'm known, and you are the lover of my soul, and I'm coming home. Even if I run away, even if I've fallen on my face, 
you will prepare a place for me waiting on my full return to thee kiss away my brokenness cure me from this hopeless heart I know you are the lover of my soul I'm coming home I'm going to sing that line again Kiss away my brokenness. You cure me from this hopeless heart I've known. You are the lover of my soul, and I'm coming home. Kiss away my brokenness. You kiss away my brokenness. Cure me from this hopeless heart I've known. You are the lover of my soul, and I'm coming home. Your love is leading me where I need. Most I don't need to hide. Truth for the keeping, your word you mean it. My God, you build a life. And I believe it when you say that I'm healed. I believe it when you say that I'm pure again, that I'm pure again. You're restoring my purity. In my heart and in my mind. I really believe that God is doing that right now. There are ways that we have compromised our purity and he is restoring it in your heart and your mind and your body right now. In Jesus' name. I really believe that. I've heard many, many testimonies of purity being restored in heart, mind, and body. Unbelievable testimonies of the Lord healing the body and making it as though sex never happened. Restoring the mind as if those memories never happened. Jesus standing in those memories, watching guard to make sure that you never feel condemnation from those again because you are a new creation. I want you all to say this. Say, Jesus, I welcome you into my memories. Emmanuel, come. Wash over my memories and meet me there so that the pain of the past and the pain of what I've done and the pain of what's been done to me would be washed over by your healing. Kiss away my brokenness Cure me from this hopeless heart I know. You are the love of my soul, and I'm coming home. Repentance is a beautiful thing. It's us participating with the mind of Christ and allowing his mind to wash over ours and his truth to wash over us so that we can finally see clearly. But no amount of shame, guilt, or condemnation will get you into the new creation. There's no way. 
It's only by his grace. It's only by his kindness that we are granted repentance. Similar to what I shared last night about my portion. This is another song that happened moments after I had defiled myself and the Lord met me and gave me a song and it happened again. And when he met me and he gave me this song, the last thing that he left me with, these lyrics that he left me with was what the disciples said to Jesus when he asked them if they were going to leave him. And it's, with you are the words of life, with you are the words of life. Cause all I ever wanted is to be close to you, here in your love, here in your love, and all I ever wanted is to be here in your love.
We want you to change our minds about ourselves And we need your help We need your help now more than ever I want my identity to be all wrapped up in you So I'll be unmovable I'll be unshakable Cause you're immovable And you're unshakable And you're unchanging And you never change My time of identity crisis is over Cause I'm a son and I'm a daughter Kindness changed my mind about myself, about my life, about my family. Oh, we trust you, Jesus, and we need you. We love you, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can everybody just thank him? I guess I am. Um, hi, how are you guys doing? Um, God is so good, and we are so blessed to be here with you guys. Sight. Um, Sai. Ooh, it's you. Wrong, Praise God. Wrong well, person, we're both up here. Wrong person. Ooh, I sorry. Know. Somebody guys. said. Somebody said something. Oh no. Yeah, you go. You can say something. Oh. What do you want to say? Blessings. Um, thank you guys, dude. Uh, let's give it up for the team and just the worship. Woo. <laughs> I. I'm very proud to be a part of this family and just what God is doing through us. And like, we are so privileged to just be, like join the family with you guys and be here yeah. and let God do what he wants to do. And we're just so blessed by you guys. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean, we're also really excited for tomorrow to happen too. Ooh, like, this night was amazing, but we have tomorrow morning as well. And then we also have to remember that this conference is not just three days. It establishes something further than that. Oh. And so we need to remember that this is not just an experience, but it's more than that. Say that, Sai. Say um, that. If you guys would like to pray and worship more and talk with the band and a few of our speakers, they'll be over by the fireplace right now. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be chill, low-key, kicking, as David would say. Good job, David. Thank you. <laughs> Um, but we really love you guys. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And I think I'm going to pray. Oh, Mark. Can I pray? Sure. Yeah. 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 It's not a big deal. We all pray. Come on. <laughs> Jesus, we need your peace. Would you just seal the deal of everything that you did tonight with peace? Wash over every single person with peace. In Jesus' name, amen.